I've got uh, six o'clock on that. Uh, we'll call the committee of the whole meeting for this evening to order and start with the roll call. Bauman? Here. Berg? Here. Bonnet? Here. Doyle? Graf? Here. Manny? Here. Montemayor? Here. Moody? Here. Perez? Here. Reinfleisch? Here. Stefan is excused. Van Akron? Vanderwilly? Here. Wangaman? Here. And Warner. Wenninger? Here. We have 15 present. On that, I would ask for approval of the minutes from the February 18th, 2004 meeting. All those, uh, are there any additions or subtractions to our minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion as stated signify by saying aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the minutes stand approved. Tonight, uh, as we find out, it's actually the start of National Weights and Measures Week, and in that, Matt Livingston from our Building Inspection Department will pre be presenting us with a presentation regarding weights and measures in the city of Sheboygan. Matt? Can everybody hear me with this? Or is it okay if I just speak without the mic? Yep. Gotta use the mic, okay. We'll start out, uh, weights and measures, 1887 to 2004 for the city of Sheboygan. The reason being, the first sealer of weights and measures was appointed by the mayor in 1887, and we've had a continuous sealer of weights and measures since. Um, the sealer is a historical title given to the uh, person that uh, inspects the weights and measures devices for the city. Uh, most notable here is uh, Joe Piekert, um, 1924 to 1963. Um, if you can imagine the uh, things that happened to this country uh, in that span that he was here. Um, and of course running up till the present. Um, this is uh, Picture of uh, inspectors, 1920s, 1930s, inspecting a uh, gas pump. The uh, test devices that he's using there are very similar to the ones we use today, and uh, we'll show you pictures of ours here shortly. Again, checking a, a fuel oil truck. We still do those inspections today. We've got some different equipment that we'll show you the, to do those. Um, first, we need to take a look at some legal issues on why we do this. Uh, first of all, Chapter 98 of Wisconsin Statutes states that uh, municipal programs uh, have to be in place in cities that have uh, over 5,000 for population. Uh, most of the, nine, the larger cities, uh, 20 total, have a uh, municipal sealer. Um, chapter 92 of the Wisconsin Administrative Code was just uh, restructured here in September of last year and adopted, and uh, that just goes into more detail on what we're supposed to inspect as a municipality and also uh, service companies, some regulations regarding them on licensing. Um, chapter 91, selling commodities by weight, measure, count, and chapter 90 of the uh, Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection um, addresses uh, fair packaging and labeling. Those have to be in place before we can inspect um, packages and commodities. And of course, our local code here, Chapter 138. Paper trails continued on handbooks that we use. These are National Institute of Standards and Technology handbooks, uh, 44, 130, and 133. And we'll detail those in a little bit here as well. And Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, Policy and Procedures Manual, uh, typifies a lot of things that we do and policies that they would like in place that may differ from the national. Um, this is handbook 44. Um, this is the book that we use probably the most in our inspections. Now this book is uh, produced by uh, NIST and it's followed by manufacturers of devices, inspectors of devices. Uh, anybody that, that is involved in weighing and measuring has a copy of this book because it, uh, again, it is the specifications, tolerances, and technical requirements for weighing and measuring devices. Now that's any device, whether it be uh, liquid measure or balances or electronic scales, anything, anything that measures or weighs. 
Handbook 130, 130 here is the uh, models of uh, laws and uh, a lot of the municipalities and states have adopted a lot of the uh, passages in here for their own law. Um, also, they've included now uh, price verification in this book as well. Um, the uh, procedure outline on how to do price verification is, uh, is the scanner checks. Handbook 133 um, is all the uh, parameters that we used in to check packages um, as far as how far they can be out of tolerance. And uh, when we're checking lots, it'll, it, there is some, some give and take on them, and this book uh, explains how all that works. And of course, the uh, DATCAP Policies and Procedures Manual. And these editions are updated every year uh, with any new information. And uh, just a, a side note here, the uh, book on the left, the gray book, um, I have in my office, and that is a 1949 edition of Handbook 44. The book on the right is a 1959 edition of uh, Handbook 133. And of course, the top one is, our, is one of the old code books from the city. Now, city standards, that's calibrated and certified equipment that we use to inspect weighing and, and measuring devices. They were originally issued by the state in, uh, in 1914. The state received theirs prior to that from the federal government. Um, and we're required to have these recertified every two years by the state metrology lab. This is an example of some of the weights that were issued in 1914, the bottom three, the two pharmacy weight sets and the, even the tape measure was issued by the state as a, a calibrated standard. Now we're properly equipped. We're legally able to do, uh, to do our inspections. Uh, we have our NIST handbooks updated. We have our local codes and we have our certified equipment. And according to ATCP 92, we're going to inspect liquid measuring devices, commodities, scales, price verification systems, timing devices, and linear measuring devices. This weight set here is a 400 gram weight set that we use to test uh, small capacity scales and high accuracy scales. This is what you'll typically see in the pharmacies and gems and, and the like. This is the, uh, usually it's called a uh, sealer's kit. It's a 30 pound weight set. We use this one the most um, for small and medium capacity scales. Um, inside that kit is a fractional weight set, the one on the right, and uh, the one in the back there is the uh, decimal weight set and used in conjunction with the other weights. Those are all two pound stainless steel cube weights. And here they are in, uh, during an inspection, checking a scale. The uh, red seal you see on the side of it is what we use to uh, indicate that we've inspected it and found it correct. These two weights here are for large capacity scales uh, up, up to 10,000 pounds. The one on the left is a 50 pound calibrated weight as well. Um, we have 20 of those. The 25 pound weight, we have 11 of those. Those are all calibrated as well. These are five gallon seraphin test measures. Um, they're calibrated as well. Um, we've used these predominantly for doing the gas stations. This is a, also a five gallon test measure. Uh, in the field, it's known as a J bucket. It's a bottom dump type um, used on the trailer. And this is the trailer that we use to do gas stations. Uh, it's a 440 gallon split tank trailer that allows us to do numerous tests. And we'll show you why we need that. Um, this is a trailer similar to ours in use in Appleton. In order to do uh, stations this size, this is the quick trip on the south side, there's 52 meters here. And if you figure the time, if we spend 10 minutes on each meter, that's 520 minutes and that's about eight and a half hours of work. That trailer enables us to get this thing done in about four hours. Uh, this is a new install. This is what we're testing. We'll, we'll go close up here. This is a Wayne uh, retail motor fuel dispenser. Um, what we're testing is these devices inside here. These are the actual meters. This is the high octane side. There's two meters here. The low octane side, there's two meters there. And then those meters work in conjunction to pr produce the mid-grade. This is what they call a blender. Um, so there's four meters inside this thing. Um, we have to do six tests, however, because of the, uh, to test the blend function. And then here is the electronic calibration. When you, when you talk about the sealer of weights and measures, this is what we're sealing. 
Um, the lead wire seals you see there, once it's been calibrated, the plungers are pushed down and then sealed. Um, that way we look when we go to our next inspection that our seals are still in place, that nobody's tampered with that meter. This one looks old, and that's because it is. This was built in 1951 by uh, Robinson Boiler Works in Nashua, New Hampshire. It's a 100-gallon test measure. Um, typically, they're referred to as a prover. This is the meter inside it. It's got a pump-off system, and this is used to test uh, tank trucks. This is a modern version of that same thing. This is another version of it. And this is what we're testing with those. If you see these big fuel trucks running around, that's what we uh, use to test them, 100 gallons at a time. Um, the error on these meters can be quite considerable. So if you figure a uh, tanker truck that delivers thousands of gallons a day, if it's off, um, they can either make a lot of money that day or they can lose a lot. So it's, uh, it's important that we test these. This is a, uh, the red trailer we showed you and the uh, green prover. This is a unit manufactured by Serum, Serafin that uh, combines both of those units in one trailer. Now we'll get into package checking. This is a, uh, our CEPTRA electronic balance. Uh, very accurate, more accurate than the scales that we test. Um, this is what we, what we call a commodity inspection scale. Um, this is uh, it in use in a store. Now if you look here, the, uh, I can tell you that the loaf of bread on there should weigh net weight 0 0.750. The gross weight as you can see here is 0.646. So we got a little problem there. All of those were sent back. And that's another reason it's important uh, that we do check weights. Uh, whoever is manufacturing this bread is, uh, isn't putting enough into the, into the mix here to, to make the weight. So that's why we check these. This is just an example uh, of being nationwide. If you look at the scale, it's the same type we have. Uh, this is New Hampshire. Weights and measures doing, doing the same thing we are and utilizing the same, the same uh, NIST handbooks to do it. This is our uh, glassware set. This is used to test liquid commodities. This is a Monarch Pathfinder um, barcode scanner. And the reason we use this um, is to do uh, price verification tests. Uh, again, this is New Hampshire using the same device we have. When you have to go into a store and test 100 items, um, it's easier to just scan the item, and what this device does, it copies that barcode, and then we take the barcode to the checkout, and they just scan the barcodes, and of course, come up with the same result as if you took the actual product up. Um, it prevents us from having to take uh, 100 items in three or four shopping carts up to the uh, checkout, and it also enables us to do a, uh, a better job of inspecting a variety of products, because typically, if you have to put everything in a shopping cart, you're not going to pick bicycles and, and large items from a variety store, and also in a grocery store, frozen items and that, we don't want to be taking them up to the checkout and doing our inspection. Uh, we have to put those all away when we're done, so it, it is time consuming, so this is a, this is a big time saver. Um, there was some discussion here tonight about timing devices. This is an example of a timing device at a car wash. This is another timing device um, that you're paying money for a certain time. This one is incorrect because it doesn't tell you how much time you're getting for your money. And that's part of that inspection process as well. Um, the latest technology we have is uh, manufactured by Nover Eggleston Associates, and that's WinWAM software. And that stands for Windows Weights and Measures Software. And all those handbooks are incorporated into that so that we can do quicker inspections um, and not have to do all the computations by hand. It also stores all the data for all the stores you've ever been to. So if we do go to a facility, we'll know what devices were in place last time we were there. So that's not to say that somebody is trying to be deceptive, but it, it does give us a better, uh, a better ability to track problems. It also enables us to do a better reporting with the state because everything can get emailed electronically in a daily, weekly, or monthly fashion. Instead of now, it's done annually. So if there is something that's uh, determined to be a problem, it'll be identified a lot quicker We're using this method. We take a look at the responsibility factors for weights and measures. Um, approximately 300 million consumers and millions of businesses across the nation 
Um, weights and measures regulations impacted four and a half trillion dollars of commercial transactions, a little more than half of the gross domestic product. And this, this was a survey done in 1998. So you can imagine if that was off just a slight bit. And uh, this will give you an example of a little error. An error of slightly more than one tablespoon per five gallons at the gas pump, that equals a change of $125 million annually. Now if you figure that, how little that is, but uh, if it's uh, not in the consumer's favor, the uh, gas stations or you can make $125 million, or on the other side of that, they can lose $125 million annually. Um, a recent budget review shows that the annual cost of U.S. Weights and Measures enforcement is just 50 cents per citizen, and that came from a survey done by the National Conference on Weights and Measures. Um, we'll take a look at fees now. We just uh, started this year, but uh, Chapter 98 of Wisconsin Statutes has allowed municipalities to assess fees for Weights and Measures services since 1983. The city of Sheboygan had until now elected not to assess fees for services. At the time, it was the only city with a municipal program that did not assess fees. Uh, this is some of the paperwork that we're generating now to, to put that process into effect. And issuing licenses, the bottom one, of course, is the actual license that they do receive. Now, weights and measures through the years um, has progressed. It, it's now more of a consumer protection and business protection. And it's done through starting at the local sealer of Weights and Measures, who discusses their findings with the Northeast Region sealers and inspectors, who in turn discusses that with the state DATCAP inspectors and staff, who in turn discusses that with the Central Conference on Weights and Measures, who in turn discusses that with the National Conference, numerous business and manufacturer associations, service companies and equipment installers, and eventually the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And they use that information to produce the handbook 44, 130, and 133. And hopefully now you know who your sealer of weights and measures is. Currently I am the president of the Wisconsin Weights and Measures Association and the chairman of the city caucus. And now that's all the, the member cities that have, that have a municipal sealer. And I'm also chairman of the liaison committee that communicates with the staff and legislative bodies on issues that affect the municipalities on uh, weights and measures issues. And I'll answer any questions. Council, any questions? <coughs> Alderman Groff. Thank you. Um, only because one was posed to me this past weekend. <clears throat> if you're requested, if your department is requested to, to come and measure something for a company that normally doesn't have, have to be measured or use your services, do you charge them something now? Alderman Manny. Thank you. Uh, how often are certain scales tested, for instance, gasoline pumps, um, scales to the supermarket? Um, minimally, the recommendation that is that they're done annually. Um, the only time we would do them more often is if we've determined that there's a compliance problem or technical issues that affect the, uh, the scale, uh, such as uh, um, hard use or something like that. Uh, something that we've uncovered historically that would indicate that more testing is needed. Uh, Matt, I know we do contract with, I think, the city of Sheboygan Falls for some services that we provide for them. Do we do that for anyone else, any other communities? And, and is it just gas pumps we're checking in Sheboygan Falls, or is that...? We're no longer doing Sheboygan Falls. We're not? Okay, no. that's a new one then. It was last year. I know we had a contract, correct? Right. That contract, that contract ran out uh, July 1st of last year. Okay. Alderman Berg. Oh. Before when we were talking, you were saying about these laundromat dryers net. You were thinking of 
putting a, a price on them. Now all of those machines normally, those big washers and dryers, they come all preset by the manufacturers. Now when, when we have a problem where I manage at Sheboygan Regency House, if we don't think it's going long enough, I call in quality appliances and they, they run a check on there with, with a wire and that in the door. And it's always found out to be true. So what is, what is the pr uh, price tag gonna be for all these dryers and that? Um, that? That's a great question. There's been a lot of discussion about timing devices. That's something that we typically didn't do in the city of Sheboygan, only now we have to because uh, ATCP 92 specifies that we do test timing devices. Um, we haven't got that entirely ironed out yet on how we're going to go about that testing and what, and what to charge for it. Uh, the only thing that we did is we took a average of what the other cities were charging for those fees and that's what we applied to ours. Um, I've heard communication from uh, from a lot of people on things they'd like changed in that, so we are reviewing that. Um, the devices are able to be changed. Um, we know that. Um, we're also in communication with the manufacturer of those devices, but uh, more than that to that inspection, there are some other factors that are involved, such as proper signage in that, um, that a consumer feels confident when they go in there that they're getting what they pay for. I want to add to that that uh, I have talked to three owners of laundromats in the city today alone and uh, they're aware of a public protection and safety meeting that's coming up next week Wednesday and uh, they actually have a communication on the council agenda tonight that's coming in to public protection and safety so we'll be discussing that next week Wednesday in committee also it's a good issue uh, Alderman Doyle yeah. <clears throat> Matt what's the error rate you know just roughly I know you're new at this and if, if there was fraud is it possible for you to detect it, or would the businessman just say, oh, we screwed up? Are you talking about all, anything that we test in general or a specific yeah, device? You know, when you go in, like, to the grocery store, do you find everything perfect or 50 things out of, out of whack or just? That, that's all, all designed into that process, what we do in applying tolerances from the manuals that we, uh, we showed. If we, if we do determine there's a problem, you know, they're going to correct it immediately. I mean, that's, that's something we look at. Um, and that's why we do the testing, and that's why we'll continue to do the testing, because uh, in some cases they may not know they have a problem. Um, we discovered uh, summer before last a gas station that had a tremendous error, and uh, they were losing about 200 gallons of gas a week. And uh, that, that's a lot of money. And, uh, of course, they were very happy that we were there. Uh, on the other side of that, um, meters do go out of, out of tolerance, and uh, with the tolerances that we apply to it, I mean, right at that test, we're going to discover the uh, error. Um, also, if you look at the records, you can see a decline in a meter, so you can pretty much tell that the next year you test, it's probably going to be out of tolerance. Um, same thing with scales, too. If you know how much weight is going across them and how much they're used, you can see a decline in it. So that's why, that's why we test every year and more often if needed if we do see a rapid decline in something. So, and, and that's what the whole program is about, is, is determining what's going to go bad and, and how long it's going to last. Um, National Council and NIST, that's why they investigate all those things to make sure that they are able to withstand commercial use. And that's all we deal with is commercial use. But I mean, you don't ever end up charging a merchant and saying you're trying to, you know, uh, under provide to the customer and so on. It, it hasn't come to that. Um, they're pretty aware. Uh, fortunately in Sheboygan here we've got we've got great business people and uh, they're they're more than happy to see if, if there's something that's not correct they want to correct it. I, I haven't had any problems with non-compliance. I, I find it interesting Matt that it, it is a two a two-way street when you talk about that the consumer is protected plus the business owner losing 200 gallons of gas a week can put a real big dent in your profit, so that's an interesting thing. Uh, Alderman Montemayor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Matt, I have a couple of questions. I didn't hear exactly what you said. You, you are now required to test? By whom? Uh, we, we've always been required to test. There, I'm, I'm there's talking about the laundromat. The stuff. timing devices? The, there was always a requirement to test them. We just typically haven't done it. But 
with, it, with the advent of ADCP 92 and what it specifies in there that we test, we had, and, and the fact that we went to a fee structure, we had to include them because it wasn't fair to other businesses that were paying for other tests to exclude someone that was required by law to, uh, to be tested. Okay. Um, so that's the laundromats. And of course, we've all gotten calls from the laundromats this week. How about the um, wa washers and dryers provided in oh, apartment buildings and nursing homes and motels? That's included? Uh, in evaluating those, we have to first determine that they are commercial use. Um, and that's, if, if someone is putting, those out, putting them out there to make a profit, that, that's, that would indicate commercial use. So that, that would have to be evaluated, certainly. Okay. And, and I don't mean to be a smart aleck, but parking meters? Our parking meters, how about those? Some municipalities do test parking meters. Um, there is a provision in the uh, statutes, though, that excludes meters utilized by a municipality, such as gas meters, water meters, parking meters. Thank you, ma'am. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a question, but I think you touched on it a little bit, uh, Matt. My question was, uh, how, do, how do you determine what fee to assess Say for example, laundromats, which is a new a new fee that's going to be uh, implemented. And obviously, as all other aldermen have mentioned, we've gotten calls from people saying, "No, no, no! It's an, now we're going to get a wash tax." You know, um, how do you go about determining what fee to access, uh, assess to keep it fair and equitable, and so that the impression is not not out there that all we're doing is generating money for revenue? That, that's a great question. The the fees that we assessed. The, the fee structure that we put into place was taken from a uh, 2002, year, year 2002 survey that was done by the uh, city caucus. And that was all the municipalities that, that charged fees submitted to the, to the uh, caucus what their fees were. And we basically took an average of those. Yeah. So we, in that we didn't, we didn't want to overstep and we didn't want to undercharge and have to uh, increase them later. Um, a lot of cities reevaluate theirs on an annual basis, and I, it's, this is all new to us, so it's, it's, it's always a learning process, but uh, we figured it was most beneficial just to do an average. Thank you. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two questions. One, are the f assessed fees uniform across the whole city for different businesses and such? And number two, how about a few comments about the uh, variety of those fees assessed across the state. We're talking average, but how broad and boldly a field do they go? That, if, if you, it's a difficult one to answer. It, it'd probably be best if we just showed you the fee survey that was done, and I have that in my office, and uh, if anybody would like a copy of that, uh, by all means get a hold of me, and, and we'll make sure that those are made available. The, uh, there are so many devices out there. There, there, there's literally tens of thousands of different types of weighing and measuring devices. So what we did is we broke them down like most cities have in the type of devices and the time it takes to test them. That's what it comes down to. When, uh, on uh, some scales that require a high degree of accuracy and, and very uh, uh, good conditions to test them, those of course may charge a bigger fee. Also uh, devices that require a lot of equipment and a lot of time require more um, and that's why the scales were broken up into certain classes. Um, fuel meters are all basically the same. So those were, that was just, that was straight across the board. So there's no variation between type of devices. Um, there, there really is no variation as to quantity. If you have X amount of meters, it's just multiplied by the, by the fee for that type of device, meter or device. So there's no, uh, it, it, it's, it's very fair across the board. Alderman Bird. How big is the staff in weights and measures department? And uh, if they would start uh, going with these dryers and things like that, would there have to be an increase of personnel? The, uh, as we showed before, the, uh, in 1887, they hired uh, one weights and measures inspector. And the, the entire staff, you're looking at them. <laughs> Um, right now, 
when, when I started, it was part-time. Um, a portion of that time was spent doing housing. Um, presently, uh, I've been doing more of that, but uh, it's, it's typically in 80% of my time. That may require a change because there is obviously more devices and we're required to do more testing of different devices. So, well, it'll work out. <laughs> Alderman Ryan Fleisch. Actually, that was my question. Um, in my unit, there's one washer, one dryer for, um, well, actually the dryer is the timing device, for um, f uh, eight units, and there's several hundred units in my area. How long does it take to do a dryer, a timing? How much is that going to cost me as a user of that to divide that annual cost up to just me and, th and seven other residents? And are you able to have time to test them all once a year? Um, that's something that, like I said, we're, we're evaluating. It, it's new to us, and unbeknownst to us, it's created the most controversy and uh, the most communication, which is good. Um, we want to know what's out there, but uh, I would expect before the end of summer here, we should have a good handle on how many devices are out there and which ones are, in fact, commercial and which ones we're going to be testing. There, that you brought up a good point that in that it is time-consuming, and we want to balance the time it takes to do them and the benefits to the community. That's very important. You should just call your staff together and talk this over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions from the council? Paulette. Paulette, if you want to use the microphone, you. Could you explain to us how, if um, a consumer goes in a grocery store, how what you do protects that consumer? Maybe just some examples. Um, one, one of the examples you just saw uh, on the loaf of bread, that it was short weight. Um, typically when we do commodities testing, we're testing anything that's a packaged commodity. And that's anything that's produced anywhere in the world. It comes into this country, it's got to have a weight declaration on it. Um, so that's what we're testing. But the focus in municipalities, and, and my focus, is on stuff that's packaged locally because I think that's what it may have the biggest effect. We want to first make sure that the scales that they're testing, that they're doing their weighing on are accurate, and secondly, that they're putting an accurate quantity in there and that they're taking tear weights off. Um, that's some of the biggest errors we see is that they forget to take tear weight off. Um, you shouldn't pay, if you're buying a steak at $7.99 a pound, you shouldn't be paying $7.99 a pound for styrofoam and plastic. Um, so those are, those are issues that we look at. So that's what protects a consumer in that they're gonna get an accurate weigh, weighing device that's weighing their product and that we're testing it to make sure that it stays accurate. And uh, you, you brought up a good point too on the price verification, that does the same thing. Um, that we're checking stores to make sure that their systems are kept accurate. Uh, when they have price changes and that, sometimes they forget. Um, most of them have programs in place to, uh, to prohibit that or to at least reduce it, but we do that testing as well and that's, that's what protects the consumer. Uh, any further questions from the council? I guess, Matt, one thing, uh, you mentioned something about state requirements and state reports once a year. How much of your time do you spend on that? Does this new software help you get to that point? Uh, not really. The, uh, works well. the uh, reporting requirements are something that we do annually. And uh, typically that's all loaded on the, on the city computer, the AS400. When we do inspections, we load that data in. So it's continually going in. So it's just, it's no different than, you know, taking permits or anything that, that's constantly updated. So at the end of the year, we have to just check that all our data is in. We have to package it up and send it to them. With the new WinWAM software, everything can be downloaded daily if you want. And it's done electronically. So it's, it, it, it's a savings on paper. It's a, sa it's a savings on labor too because uh, we don't have to maintain the system all year and make sure everything gets entered. When the inspection's done, the data is already in here, and once this is hooked up, they can shoot it down to state electronically. Okay. They, they're requiring more reporting, especially on a lot of the commodities checks, and uh, to get a quicker handle on uh, things that have gotten out of tolerance, such as fuel meters. So it, they, they appreciate it, or I guess they have, their, they have a desire to have that done quicker. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, in that we reported on the devices we inspected before, now we're going to be reporting, uh, there's a, a seven or a five year plan to get that all in place for reporting on all the inspections that we do and all the results. So there'll be more stuff to report. 
that'll make it easier for us to do it. That way we don't spend a lot of time um, building that database. Mm -hmm. So in effect, there's a certain amount of state mandate in the program other than us protecting the consumers and businesses. Absolutely. Out there. Mm -hmm. Alderman Perez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just final uh, comment, uh, uh, Matt, if you would, I would ask that to the extent that you possibly can uh, try to be as ex inclusive as you possibly can with these laundromat owners because this has the potential of becoming a hot potato. I can see it already. Uh, it, uh, it, it would create a problem where there probably isn't one. And I think that the more inclusive you are as far as input and commentary and, and so forth, I think people will appreciate that because I can see you're obviously very knowledgeable about that. They need to know that too. They need to know that Matt Livingston is doing a good, a good thing for this community and then it all come back to, to benefit the community in whole, as a whole. So I would ask that if, if, if you're able to, to be as inclusive as you possibly can with the community, with the laundromat owners. Thank you. And I, and I did ask Matt that question. I guess uh, every owner of a laundromat in the city was notified back in uh, June, did you say it was? Or? Um, June is when the ordinance was published to go to fees. And uh, we really didn't hear much from them uh, until they got the letters that it was, it was coming up. And, and that, was a, that was a great point, too, that they did uh, respond. And uh, there, there was one of them that uh, provided me with a lot of information. I'm still going to meet with him and uh, go over some of the, the stuff because they're going to show, show things that I don't know. And uh, so that is good that uh, they've come forward and, and have done it the right way. They've, uh, they've gotten together with, their, with the other members and uh, are going to bring it forward. So it's a good uh, learning experience for both of us. Alderman Moody. Um, Matt, do you have anything to do with restaurants and portion sizes? I, an example I want to give you is one time my husband and I stopped at Dairy Queen in Plymouth. I asked for a baby cone. It was piled that high. I mean, the next clerk might have given me a baby cone that was maybe piled that high. If I took a nutrition chart of Dairy Queen products and I wanted to look up how much, like, calories or carbohydrate grams a baby cone had, you couldn't really determine that because two different clerks would give you two different sizes. That, uh, that falls under the selling commodities by weight measure count. In that type of uh, a serving, that's what they call a ready to eat food. Mm -hmm. And there's no weight declaration on it. So that, that's something that we can't enforce logically. There's, there's no means to, to say that it has to weigh this or it has to weigh that. Um, and but that's why that before we test anything, it has to have a, a legal mm -hmm. weight declaration on it. It has to be properly packaged in that. Um, that's something I guess I would take up with the, with the server. And but that's, that's the no different than uh, um, fish portions at a restaurant or anything. Right. That, I mean, that's all ready to eat foods, and that's a whole different, uh, different mm -hmm. ballgame there. But by the same token, like almost any chain restaurant, you'll be able to get a nutrition chart and there has to be a certain weight for that certain item to give you the nutritional values. That, that's a good point. And that's, those nutrition charts are based on a certain size of that serving. Right. And that's, that's a good point. Uh, unfortunately, it's not something that we can, uh, we can enforce unless it is a, okay. a prepackaged commodity with and a weight there, declaration. And there's no one that does enforce that, I assume. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. That's probably something statewide DATCAP would probably look okay. into. Okay, thank you. Council, any further questions? Move to adjourn. Second. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> First, I'd just like to thank Matt, Matt Livingston and the Building Inspection Department, Weights and Measures Department. He's actually part of both, department. all of one and part of another, uh, for the presentations that I thought was very interesting and actually quite timely with some of the issues we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. I'm sorry, it's, uh, we're not open to the floor. But I'd have a motion to adjourn. No, I have a motion to let my husband speak. Second. Do you open the question? floor? That's council. All in favor of opening the floor? Aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Hearing none. You may speak. How are you, Paul? That's, uh, Example of the loaf of bread, okay, that, that you showed on your slide there. Now, this was underweight. Now, is that, <clears throat> if the store doesn't have its own bakery and it's distributed to the store and you gig this for this underweight thing, 
who gets the violation? The grocery store or the distributor? And then if this violation happens more than, do you follow up on these violations? The, in that example that we gave you there, that product was taken off sale. And anytime we find something that's short weight, we immediately remove it from sale. Um, we'll check it again um, because we give them that report when we're done and it, it explains you know, that it is short weight. Um, typically, that, those are taken care of rapidly um, only because they, they can't sell it. And if they do, they do put it back out, well then of course it's a violation. We, we can cite them for it, but it really doesn't solve the problem. Um, when we give it back to the store, if it wasn't packaged there, the store will immediately give it back to their supplier. So it does, it does make its way back rather rapidly. Um, I, there was an example of that with mushrooms that I did find that were short weight. And within a half an hour, I was talking to the packer in Pennsylvania. So it does, things like that do happen rapidly. And in, in that industry, people do respond quickly to it because it is, you know, they want to be correct. I understand. It, Thank it, you. Will, it will go right down the line. Thank you. And you get to do it all yourself. That's the main thing. So, all those in favor of adjournment? Aye. Several votes aye. Stand adjourned. <laughs>